Thanks, PK. Thanks for the invitation. I'm excited to be here with all these experts in the room, and uh, we're going to hopefully see some great stuff the next uh, couple of days. Uh, let's see. Let's click it. These are my disclosures. Nothing pertinent for this talk. So I'm going to talk about FEMPOP CTO crossing algorithm access wires and crossing devices, and I'm going to do it all in 10 minutes. So the idea here is I'm going to try to give you some basics, some very basic stuff. Not a lot of data, but a lot of basics on some of this stuff so that when you go back and start doing your own research, your reading and doing cases and so forth, that you have a good framework to kind of set all this stuff up. Obviously, the problem with FEMPOP CTOs is all these things that we see here, procedure time, radiation exposure, contrast, volume, et cetera, dissection and so forth. But the biggest thing is that depending on the experience of the operator, when you look at the literature, there's still a 20 to 50% failure rate of crossing a FEMPOP CTO. So what does that mean? That means that you are unsuccessful in your revascularization. And as we all know, in patients that have CLI and have no other options, whether it's bypass, et cetera, that can really have dire consequences. So in terms of algorithms, there are many algorithms out there on how to cross an SFA CTO. This is one by Dr. Roy that was published in 2016 where her and her team and colleagues basically looked at plaque composition. And based on this plaque composition, they came up with an algorithm that determined that this is the type of access you should use, this is the type of guide wire I should use, and um, this is the type of therapy I should deliver. And so it was interesting that they came up with this, but again, you know, we don't have hard, fast data on this, on this type of stuff. The next one came out a few years later with Fadi uh, and, and Saab and, his, and his, uh, his group when they published the CTOP classification. I think this was probably the first real practical uh, algorithm uh, using plaque, morpho excuse me, plaque morphology, right? So we know that CTOs have proximal and distal caps as well as different CTO caps within them. But the idea here was that based on these caps, we can decide whether we need anti-grade access, retrograde access, dual access, what's the success rate, and so forth. And they were able to come up with their algorithm, which is really based on the length of the stenosis and the degree of calcification. And so based on this, they found some independent predictors of success and whether dual or single access was needed. Obviously, if you look on the top left image, the type 1 CTOP, CTO is the most common and you're more likely to be successful in an anti-grade fashion. I think it makes sense when you look at the morphology of that cap that at least you'll start your CTO in an intraluminal fashion. Where you end up is, is obviously a different question. So this was kind of the next stepping stone in terms of algorithms for crossing FEMPOP CTOs. A couple of years later, uh, the PCTO group uh, led by Dr. Banerjee published an algorithm uh, which they first presented at TCT in 2018. And the idea here was, again, they were going to use angiograms and extravascular ultrasound or EVIS to really help determine how am I going to tackle this CTO. And again, they came up with their idea of how to do it. And so with all these algorithms, and there's many more, there's many more that are being published, I think you can start seeing that the bottom line is there's no perfect algorithm for crossing a FEMPOP CTO, and I think that's what makes it difficult and challenging. I think the coronaries, they have much more strategic algorithms for crossing CTOs. I defer to PK and, and my cardiology colleagues on that. But that's something you need to think of. So now what about access? Well, access, we've got all these access points now. You know, we've obviously got brachial, but I think most of us are not using it as often as we used to, but radial all the way down to the toes. And um, there's a couple things to think about. So when you're tackling a FEMPOP CTO, I think the most common access is probably the up and over technique. That makes sense. Don't forget about anti-grade uh, CFA, anti-grade SFA. And the biggest question on this is people always ask, well, how low can I go if I'm going to puncture the proximal SFA? Well, the main thing is that I typically, and a lot of heavy, you know, busy CLI operators basically look at the SFA and they say to themselves, if I can compress this with under ultrasound guidance, and the vessel looks relatively healthy, I can pretty much go down to the lesser troke and have no problems in terms of bleeding complications, hematoma, pseudoaneurysms, et cetera, whether it's manual compression or, or closure devices. Obviously, there's pedal access. We're all familiar with all these different vessels that we can access. A couple of things to realize, as you all know, is that it can be ultrasound guided, fluoroscopic guided, and, um, oops, sorry, go back to previous. Fluoro-guided and obviously contrast-guided. Uh, 
And obviously there's perineal access, which is something that's uh, typically done angiographically. You can try to do with ultrasound, but remember this vessel is very deep. And remember that the higher you go on the leg, the compartments are larger. And as Brian and my and Christian and my surgical colleagues will tell you, the, the risk for compartment syndrome becomes more significant. Here are a couple of slides from a good friend of mine, Miguel Montero Baker, is a vascular surgeon out in Houston. And you can see here, he's not only accessing the perineal artery on that initial slide that I showed you, but he's also accessing the TP trunk. And in, in this case, to the far right, the P3 segment of the popliteal artery. But again, remember, this is not to be taken lightly. These are limb salvage cases. This is not somebody that you, you know, I, I would hope you would not do this in a cavalier fashion with a claudicant. And remember, your risk of, of uh, compartment syndrome and significant bleeding in these cases is pretty high if you're unable to cross and deliver therapy from above. Obviously, there's distal SFA access, as in this case is FEMPOP CTA. I think this is a nice access that can be done very safely. You can use a catheter and, and various guide wires. You know, I think rarely I put sheaths in, and you know, hundreds and hundreds of cases I've done, and I think the guys at Link have also showed this, that they've had very, very few hematomas or disruption of the tissue. Obviously, if you have an occluded stent, and you can't get through that proximal cap from above, don't forget about a modified Schmidt procedure where you can basically access the stent directly and basically try to achieve through and through access. Of course, there are also alternative access sites with which I've used, uh, especially in limb salvage cases, lateral plantar artery, digital artery access, and so forth. These are obviously accesses that, again, I typically don't do in a claudicant, but that's me. Some people do. But obviously, in a limb salvage case, all bets are off, and we need to make something happen. What about guide wires? When you look at guide wires, you know, we have eight vascular fellows every year, and they're always asking the same questions. What guide wire? They're trying to remember names. And I think the best thing to do is rather than remember names and, and get hung up in that, especially when you're training, are learning about this. Remember, every company publishes guide wires in this fashion. And these are the names that they give them, frontline navigation or workhorse, guide wires to get you someplace, specialty wires or CTO wires, wires to help cross a CTO or get through a high-grade stenosis, obviously delivery and support wires. These are the wires, and any wire can really can function like this to help you deliver therapy or deliver a device, whether it's atherectomy or something else. And you can see here are all various companies. They all have frontline workhorse or navigation guide wires, and you can see here that basically there's tons of them. So how do you decide which ones to use? That comes really from experience. It comes from uh, your mentors, how you trained, what you learned, and basically what you're comfortable with. And that's the way to think about it. CTO wires, same thing. There's a whole host of wires you can use. And obviously delivery and supportive wires. And remember, any wire that allows you to deliver therapy or a device safely can be used as a delivery wire. And you just have to get comfortable with a group of these. You don't have to know every single wire that you see on these lists. So what about some guide wire facts that I thought were pertinent? Obviously, there's a whole host of things we can talk about, but I don't want to put everybody to sleep. So let's stick with two that I think are really important. One of them is think about when you do a guide wire escalation, moving from 014 to 018. The formula is radius to the fourth power. So you are increasing the strength of that guide wire almost three, three times when you just escalate from 014 to 018. So when you're tackling a FEMPOP CTO, you can see how this really makes a difference in terms of pushability, torqueability, et cetera, et cetera. What about tip load? The minimum grams of pressure needed to deflect the distal one centimeter of a guide wire, two millimeters. So for tip load, that's obviously an, an important point when you start looking at guide wires. And basically, here is a slide of three different guide wires. I'm going to click on here so they all play. Going low, medium, and high tip load guide wires. And you can see the low tip load guide wire on the far left has a lot of prolapse. You get into the medium a little bit less. You go to the far right. Now you have almost no prolapse, which is why it's more likely to, to dissect or penetrate a cap. But obviously, you can also have problems with perforation, and that can, and that can cause an issue. Now, there's various catheter guide wire CTO crossing techniques. These are all, there's these, and there's, there's many more, star, et cetera, et cetera. And I think these are things you can look up and learn about. These are very common things that most operators use to cross CTOs, and they're very helpful. And then, obviously, if you've never seen a CTO or crossed a CTO, which I hope uh, everybody in this room has and everybody that's watching has, you can see there's various techniques. The far left is a four French Navy cross catheter. I'm crossing a CTO using classic Navi bossing technique, where I'm basically pushing and rotating the, the catheter. And then you've got a couple other uh, techniques, knuckle wire in the middle, 
And then if you look on the far right, you can see that you've basically got a classic subintimal recanalization with a CTO catheter, and in this case, a Command-18 guide wire. And you can see the, the guide wire and the catheter spiraling around the vessel. So you're clearly in the subadventitial space, as my surgical colleagues will say, or in the subintimal spaces, as many other people will tell you. So these are very important techniques to know and to be masters of. The other thing I want to show you is there's also a technique called the Janali technique. This is really described by Jihad Mustafa a few years ago. Uh, and you'll see him doing this when he does live cases. And when I've talked to him about this, he's basically using a CTO catheter, and in this case, a guide wire that's 018 with a hydrophilic tip, classically a V18. He's basically prolapsing it, rotating it, creating kind of almost a corkscrew appearance and using it. And you can see under, inter, under uh, extravascular ultrasound, you can see the rotation that's happening, basically like a drill. So it's another technique to use for crossing. What about crossing devices? These are very important things that we need to go over, right? So we've got a whole host of devices that can be used, and I'll go through these quickly just for the, in terms of time. Obviously, there's the BART or BD CT, uh, CTO crosser catheter. This obviously requires a generator. It, it basically converts AC power into mechanical vibrational energies. You get a jackhammer type effect. There's obviously some micro bubble disruption and cavitation, and it comes with two, two devices, the S6, which uh, is for highly calcified lesions, and the 14S, which is kind of the workhorse catheter. And you're basically using various catheters with different shapes to guide this jackhammer through the CTO. Obviously, there's the front runner catheter, which basically is a uh, small uh, device that has jaws at the end. It can be shaped. It opens 2.3 millimeters in diameter, and you can see it creates blunt microdissection. You can see in this video, and I sped this up, so I, I don't typically push it this fast, but you can see that I've sped up this video to show you that it can basically create a microchannel uh, within a CTO, which then would allow you to get uh, through and through access with a guide wire. I think this is another guy, uh, catheter system that hit the market recently in terms of CTO crossing, which PK has shown on one of his live cases, the go-back catheter from Upstream Peripheral Technologies. And what it is, is you can basically see, if you look in the video, you can see that you're able to direct a uh, needle into the CTO and change its direction. So you can imagine that this lets you snake through the CTO and then eventually get guided. This is great for, for, for puncturing through very dense, tough caps. Uh, whether they're proximal or distal or within the CTO itself. And it can also be used as, oh, I guess it's the same video. Sorry about that. Um, it can also be used as a seat, as a reentry device, as you can see here. So if you have a subintimal recanalization, you can use it much like the out, it's similar to the outback or the cordis outback, where you have an entry needle that can be used to uh, re-enter the true lumen. Sorry, that video didn't play. Now, the other, finally, we've got the laser. There's obviously two companies that make laser, and this is a technique that's been described, but is considered off-label by the companies. It's the step-by-step -step technique. If you're having trouble getting through that proximal cap or through the CTO, you can basically use it to advance a guide wire to the cap, vaporize with laser, and then basically advance it step by step through the CTO, as you can see here. Obviously, we're more familiar with laser when it comes to ISR and obviously laser atherectomy. There are two companies that have a laser out currently. The newest one is the Angiodynamics laser, which is a uh, solid state technology. It's a higher wavelength at 355 with a shorter pulse width. What does that mean in, in uh, non-medical lingo? basically means that apparently it works better in calcium. That obviously needs to be borne out with better, more research and more data, but that's basically what the company is saying at this point. It has the ability, especially their, their larger catheters, which are two millimeters and 2.35 millimeters, they have aspiration ability, which I think adds a, a new uh, uh, important thing uh, while using this device. The next one is a uh, eczema laser. It's the laser by Philips. It obviously has a larger footprint, 308 nanometer laser, so shorter wavelength and a longer pulse width. Um, this one uh, functions on a 220 volt, so you do need uh, a separate connection and some stuff to be done before you can use it. Unlike the previous one I showed you, which is 110 volts, so it just plugs into a regular power outlet. The tur turbo power, turbo lead are the most common catheters that people are using. But the difference with this one, because of the way it works, you have to flush out contrast before you use it. So if you have a catheter, you've crossed and you've done an angiogram, make sure you flush that contrast out. And the reason is you can see this here. On the left is saline. That's the way the laser should function. On the right, you can see you get this explosive effect. 
And although you don't want to do this because you can cause a dissection in an artery, you can tear an artery or perforate an artery, there are some people that do use this in the coronaries. A uh, couple more and then we're done here. The Merritt spinner catheter. This is basically, as you see, it basically spins a guide wire at 2,500 uh, RPMs and it basically lets you drill through a CTO. This is very similar to basically the technique that's described uh, in the literature as the drilling technique, right? When you're rotating a, a guide wire with a torque device as rapidly as you can to cross. In this case, you're doing it with a device. This works for all guide wire platforms, 014 to 038. The Avenger Ocelot is another device that has uh, obviously capital equipment involved. This is a CTO crossing catheter using OCT. So here we're using optical coherence tomography to visualize basically uh, plaque as well as the layers of the arterial wall. And as you can see here, because you can see where you're going, you're able to snake through the CTO to gain uh, access. And it commonly will give you uh, intraluminal crossing. And we have this device, we've used it uh, with success many times. Uh, the Medtronic Viance is another catheter that you can use. Uh, this one basically has a, a handle which you can rotate very uh, uh, quickly in order to basically dissect through a CTO and allow guide wire access uh, through it. Uh, finally, we have the Wingman or the Wingman Crossing uh, Catheter by Reflow. This is another catheter which is a braided reinforced microcatheter. Through it, you can put basically a radiopaque beveled tip, which allows you to kind of rotate and dis determine the direction that you want your guide wire to travel. And it lets you pierce really dense uh, calcified CTO caps. And it's very radiopaque. And obviously, you can use this to uh, gain uh, through and through access. Obviously, we're not going to talk about these, but remember, there are re-entry uh, devices, which you all have seen here, the Antir, the Outback, and the Pioneer Plus, which is an IVIS-guided uh, re-entry device, which looks like an Outback, but it has IVIS guidance. And then obviously, the Go-Back catheter, which can also be used for subintimal recanalization. Uh, thank you. Great job. <laughs>